A few years ago, in a nearby quarry, they set off a blast of gelignite which dislodged an entrance to a cave. We're at the entrance to that cave, called the Sorek Cave near Jerusalem. Inside are some amazing sights. It's unfortunate that the lighting inside the cave doesn't permit us to show it as it truly is. It really is quite breathtaking. Maybe Revelation chapter 5 and verse 13 does have some significance. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne. Let's go now and see the things that are of the sea. There's some really fantastic things in the underwater observatory here at Hilat. Let's go and take a closer look at them, shall we? just really unbelievable. My reason tells me that this just can't be the result of blind evolutionary chance. There just has to be an omnipotent creator behind it all, don't you think? Besides the wonders of the land and sea, there are, of course, the wonders of the heavens. <laughs> These are not confined to Palestine, of course, but Abraham knew something about these wonders of the heavens. One night, it says here that God spoke to him in Genesis 15 and in verse 5. He brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And I suppose Abraham looked up into those beautiful star-spangled heavens and admired them just as you and I can. But you know, it's very significant that he said to Abraham, just count the stars if you can. Now, people thought they could count the car stars. Oh, I knew one astronomer a long time ago who carefully counted them, 2,200 stars. He had it all worked out. But then, of course, came the telescope. And now we know that the heavens are just ablaze with burning stars, millions and millions and millions of stars across the heavens. And not only the stars, of course, that can be seen by the naked eye. I don't know what Abraham saw. Perhaps God gave him telescopic vision in his dream too, in this particular vision that he appeared to him. And if so, he could have seen those beautiful planets 
with their uh, rings around them, you know, and uh, their moons circling around them. He could have seen the uh, nebulae, you know, that beautiful nebula in Orion, stretching across the sky, millions and millions of light years in size. And the colors, absolutely fantastic. And other nebulae too. There are so many beautiful sights in the heavens and as the telescope sweeps across the skies, perhaps as Abraham could see it, what a beautiful sight it is. And you'd have to say, well, it just couldn't have all happened. There must have been a creator behind it. And I'll tell you something else too. Over here in the book of, of uh, Job, chapter 26, and in verse 7 it says, He stretches out the north over the empty space he hangs the earth on nothing. <laughs> That's terribly significant. People back there thought that the earth must be sitting on something, four pillars or the back of Hercules or on the back of an elephant or something like that. But here the Bible says he hangs the earth on nothing. And today we know that our planet, like all the rest of the universe, is suspended in space. Now, it had to be a revelation for men to know that, for Moses to be able to write that in the book of Job. And so there's plenty of evidence that it was the Creator who made these things. It was the Creator who was there when it was all made. And believe me, that's the best witness, isn't it? If you want to know where the universe came from, ask the Creator. He was there. The scientists know a lot, my friends, but they don't know everything. They weren't there when it all happened, but God was. And I believe the best way to find out where the universe came from is to look in the sacred books of God. The Bible begins where all good books used to begin, and that's at the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, and in verse 1 it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. What a simple and sublime statement that is. Nothing here about a long, drawn-out evolutionary process. Now, some people might say, yes, but the scientists have the evidence on their side, you know. I know that the scientists come up with some evidence, but the most important evidence after all is that of an eyewitness. And let's face it, the evolutionists, no matter how clever they were, were not there. God was. And God tells us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so we have not ascended from beasts or animals. Actually, we're on the way down. We have descended from a noble pair of people, Adam and Eve, and it was a perfect creation. It tells us here in Genesis 1 and in verse 31, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. It was a beautiful world. No arid deserts, no turbulent seas, just a beautiful world with flowers, trees, and even nature was at peace, even the animals, the birds, everything was at peace. It tells us here in Genesis 1 and in verse 30, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And so the tigers were not to prey on the gentle deer, and the cat was not going to torment the mouse before it ate it, not even the birds were going to eat the worms. Just everything was at peace. There was to be no death. And man was to live forever. It says here in chapter 2 and in verse 9, Out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. You see, by eating of this tree of life, a man would have that element which would enable him never to die, to live forever. And that was God's plan, wonderful plan. And so it was to be a wonderful world. And man himself was to uh, be at peace with all nature. God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. No slaughterhouses, no need of slaying the animals to live. God gave man a wonderful vegetarian diet. And the face of nature was all different. It says here in chapter 2, and in verse 5, the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Just a gentle dew every morning. 
And so it was a wonderful world that God had made. And as he looked upon it, he was able to say that everything was good. Now, it rather surprises me that there are many Christians who profess to believe the theory of evolution rather than the story of creation. And I really don't think they should, you know, because Jesus Christ, the author of the Christian religion, came out very strongly on the side of creation. He certainly was no evolutionist. He said here in Mark chapter 10 and in verse 6, these are the words of Jesus, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. There's no question about it. Jesus Christ upheld the, the wonderful origin of man as told in the creation story. And of course, Jesus Christ ought to know because he really was the creator. I'm reading in Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 16 where it says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And so he is both the creator and the upholder of the entire universe. But it is true, something went wrong with this wonderful world. You see these thistles here? Sometimes the flowers on thistles look very beautiful, but I'll tell you, you grab a thistle and it hurts. Something went wrong, you see. And it was because man sinned that this curse came on the world. And we've got the thorns and the thistles and all the other unpleasant things in this world. In fact, a second great curse came on the world as recorded in Genesis chapter 6 and in verse 5 where it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man just went continually downhill, you see. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast. This world just became so terribly wicked, God couldn't do anything further with it. And so he said, I just have to wipe it all out. And so God said to Noah, verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Would you like to know what that ark looked like? Charles Ward is an engineering draftsman who has given a lot of intensive study to the instructions that were given to Noah on the building of his ark. And he has here a very beautiful model of what he thinks that ark must have looked like. Charles, can you tell us first of all, what were the dimensions of Noah's ark? It was about 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits deep. A cubit being about elbow to fingertip. <laughs> well, that means that this a vessel must have been about 150 metres in length. That's, that's an enormous length, isn't it? Um, I suppose there are vessels that size in existence today, in fact, even bigger, so, but it was remarkable that there should have been a, a vessel that size so long ago. Mm. Uh, Charles, what about this window or gap on top here? I mean, 40 days and 40 nights of rain, a lot of water must have poured in there. Have you got any idea as to just how this could have been coped with? Well, most of the people when they draw a model of the ark or, or make a model, put a window in the end, a square window, but it would never have been sufficient, would never have given enough light or enough ventilation. So I've made my model in that way. I have got it laid out in this fashion that I have the gap in the top and it does say that the window should be above yeah, and finished yeah. in a cubit, not a, a cubit square. So I've made the cubit wide running all the way down the canopy and of course I've got de gaps in these decks too so the light can get right down at the bottom and the stale air can get out. And I've got water troughs running all the way down the ark mm -hmm. so that as it rocks and it rains the water can fall down into those troughs. Does this device illustrate that? Well this here is a type of a pump. I've never seen one of these before in my life. But the idea came to me while I was working on this project and it's had a system of channels and as you just rock it gently back and forth, it'll lift up all the fluid and spill it out the side. Perhaps they had a couple of those in Noah's Ark, one at each end. And of course, we can't be positive no, of that, but still, it's a plausible sure. suggestion, isn't it? Mm -hmm. eh? Now, what do you think about the animals? There must have been a lot of animals there. Got any idea about the cubic capacity? I notice on your diagram and in this, it had three decks, right? Yes. So have you got any idea ab uh, about the cubic capacity or the floor capacity of this uh, ve uh, vessel? Yes, the uh, average uh, animal would have been about the size of a small dog. 
and he would have had about the size of this table for the for each each small dog or two tables for two dogs and um, two mice which had about would have had about the size of a shoe box and two elephants well about the size of the average front yard yes. so you reckon they could all fit in here yes there's no doubt about it. there was plenty of space to spare I believe that this section would be the habitable part of the ark and the ends could have been used for the storage of food now they all had to eat yeah. Uh, do you think that Noah could have gathered enough food and uh, stored it here for the time that they were in the ark? Have you done any figures yes, on this? Yes, I have, and there will be more than three times as much capacity in the end for the amount of time that they were in the ark. Well, the biblical record says that there was a flood, and it was a big one. In Genesis chapter 7, and in verse 19 it says, And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Now, I don't imagine that the hills and mountains were as high as they are today because mountains like Everest and Kanchenjunga and so forth indicate that they were folded, they were pushed upwards. And so before the flood, they could have just been rolling hills. But according to the biblical record, the whole earth was submerged beneath the waters of the flood. And that changed the whole surface of the earth. It also meant that fossils were locked in, that means uh, creatures, shellfish and uh, animals were buried under the slushy waters and mud and they were locked in there and so preserved and we find the fossils today. Now what evidence is there that we can find to support this from an archaeological point of view? A very interesting bit of evidence let me tell you. In 1872 George Smith was translating tablets in the British Museum, a keen young fellow who'd learned to read the cuneiform script. And one day he was translating tablets there from Nineveh, and he found a tablet that just sounded like the flood story. And so he read the, uh, the translation to a group of scientists, and that got into the newspapers, and it created such a sensation that the Daily Telegraph came and offered him a thousand pounds if he'd go out and find the rest of the tablets because he, he had only one broken piece. Well, George Smith wasn't about to turn down an offer like that, even though it seemed like looking for a needle in a haystack, and out he went to Nineveh. Would you believe it? One week later, he found another ten segments of this tablet, eleven altogether. They're in the British Museum today, and they're known as the Gilgamesh Epic. Now, you know the story in the Bible, how there was the flood and uh, only eight people went in there, all the rest were drowned and destroyed, all the whole of mankind was destroyed. And uh, after the flood had been on the surface of the earth, then the waters dried up after 150 days and uh, Noah sent out a, a dove and a raven and finally he and all the animals left the ark. Well. In the translation of the Gilgamesh epic, we find virtually the same story. I'll read just a few snatches of it, shall I? Gilgamesh, I will reveal unto thee a hidden and a secret of the gods will I tell thee. Shurapak, a city that thou knowest and which now lies in ruins on the bank of the Euphrates, when that city was old and there were yet gods within it, the great gods decided to bring on a deluge. Lord of Shurapak, son of Ubu, Tatu, destroy thy house and build a vessel. Abandoning riches, do thou seek out living kind. Despising possess possessions, preserve what has life. Thus load in the vessel the seed of all creatures. When something of morning had dawned, I commanded that the land be assembled, the boys fetching pitch. That, of course, is just what the Bible says. They sealed it with pitch, while the stronger brought timber materials. I made enter the vessel all my family and kindred, beasts, wild and domestic, and all of the craftsmen I made enter the vessel. Came the set appointed time. Who was sending the bane did pour down the rain. For six days and seven nights the wind blew and the flood and the storm swept the land. The whole of mankind had returned under clay. When I looked out again in the directions across the expanse of the sea, Mountain ranges had emerged in 12 places and on Mount Nazir the vessel had grounded. Of course, the biblical record says Mount Ararat. On the seventh day's arriving, I freed a dove. 
Forth went the dove, but came back to me. Then I set forth a swallow, and did release him. Forth went the swallow, but came back to me. So I set free a raven, and did release him. Forth went the raven, and he saw again the natural flowing of the waters. He ate, flew about, and he croaked, and came not returning. I poured a libation, and scattered a food offering. The God smelled the savour, the God smelled the sweet savour. Has aught of living kind escaped? Not a man should have survived the destruction. There's a lot of similarities between that and the biblical story. Now, of course, when the uh, scholastic world uh, heard about this, they said, aha, now we know. The Bible copied the story from the Gilgamesh epic. And, of course, there were those who said, oh, no, the Gilgamesh epic was copied from the Bible. I would point out that nobody copied anyone. This seems to be a common story among all civilizations. There was a man by the name, a journalist by the name of Rini Neuerbergen, who got fascinated by this subject, and he did a lot of research, went to, know, to Mount Ararat a number of times, and he wrote this book called The Ark File. He made a point of tracing all these legends in all the different civilizations, South America, North America, uh, Africa, islands of the sea. He found 80 different legends in various countries of the world, which indicates that really all mankind must have descended from Noah and his family, and that's the only way you can account for all these legends. So the evidence is that there was a dramatic destruction by water and mud at the time of Noah's flood. But now, let's talk to some of the scientists to see what they say about the evidences. There are two schools of thought, David. One school of thought uses the fossils to index the dates of the rocks. But there's a problem with the evolutionary school of thought that uses fossils as, as indexes to dating. And that is they tend to use the fossils to date the rocks and the rocks to date the fossils, which, if I'm not mistaken, is a fairly circular piece of reasoning. The other school of thought would seem to uh, point towards a major cataclysm or a series of cataclysms that have destroyed all living matter on the planet at some point of time or several occasions. I personally am fully persuaded from the evidence I see on this earth and from the evidence, a little bit of evidence I've picked up in, in fossils and from reading the story of nature that there have been some massive cataclysms on this earth and they fit in extremely well with the idea that there was a massive flood that, that destroyed all living matter on the planet and fits in with the story of Genesis. A cell is not put together haphazardly. Each cell is composed of its various parts which are very important to the function of that cell. First of all, in the nucleus you have the DNA molecules which bears the inheritable characteristics for that organism. Each cell of the body has that code, that genetic code as we call it, designed to produce a whole organism you can't have one part without the other. And remember, it's what lies next to the other part that's important. It's put together in a, in a designed way. And this, I believe, is the greatest aspect of biology that nobody can deny. To prove that there is a designer behind it all, how could it come about by chance? Fred, could you tell us in simple language just how this radio dating works? Well, David, I think most people know that uh, green plants take carbon dioxide from the air from which they manufacture food. Now, the food manufactured by plants is the basis of all animal nutrition. Now, in the carbon dioxide in the air, there is a certain amount of carbon-14, which is a radioactive form of carbon. 99% of all carbon is carbon-12. But this carbon-14, which is radioactive, disintegrates at a, a measured rate. Now, if we take a, a piece of a leaf from the tree and it dies, then immediately the carbon-14 intake ceases. 
the amount is fixed and from then on becomes less and less. If we now examine a piece of this tissue, that is after a lapse of time, and measure the amount of carbon-14 left in it, we can get some sort of a, an idea of the time lapse since that leaf died. Now that's really the basis of carbon dating. And uh, does it really work? I mean, uh, have dates been uh, deduced from this accurately? Well, no, no uh, method of dating is more accurate than its uh, basic assumptions. Now, there are two basic assumptions in carbon dating, one being that the amount of radiocarbon in the atmosphere has been constant over long, long periods of time, and the second is that uh, the rate of disintegration of carbon-14 has always been constant. Now, this is something like uh, trying to uh, gauge the time a candle has been burning by measuring the remaining portion of it. You can measure the present rate of burning and you can make some sort of an educated guess at the original length of the candle and from that you could, you could come to a fairly accurate uh, measure of the time the candle has been burning. But the, you can never be precisely sure that that rate has always been the same. And uh, has this always worked accurately as far as the results are concerned? Well. Um, W.F. Libby, who is the father and the uh, foremost authority on radiocarbon dating, maintains that the radiocarbon dates and historical dates over a 4,000 year period coordinate fairly well. And so I think within that range we can be fairly confident of uh, carbon dates. But there are some anomalies that uh, take some explaining. For instance, there were water snails, living water snails, whose shells dated at 27,000 years old. And there was a, a mammoth found uh, in the frozen tundra. Uh, his hair happened to be 26,000 years old, but the, the peat was only 5,600 years old. So there are contradictions, eh? So there are these problems which make it difficult to accept without, well, without some reservations, the, the carbon dates. Have there been examples that you know of where the scientists have made mistakes? Well, sure. I mean, you go back into history and you find that uh, at one time we had what was known as the phlogiston theory of uh, burning. Now that of course has been proved to be entirely false. Uh, there are other mistakes that have been made and then of course there's human pride and ambition which comes in with a desire to achieve fame. You must know of the Piltdown Man uh, who, uh, which proved to be an entire hoax of somebody who wanted to be famous and finding a missing link. And then there was the Nebraska man who was fashioned from a tooth. Just a tooth. Uh, just a tooth, but uh, it later was proved that that tooth was the tooth of a pig. Oh. <laughs> then there was the Java man. There was a um, Eugene Du Bois who found the top of a skull and a thigh bone uh, from which were fashioned the Java Man. Now, Java Man appeared in all the school textbooks as a kind of an ape-like ancestor of man. But it was shown later on, uh, revealed, that Du Bois had also found obviously human skulls in the same sedimentary deposits. And he could have just as well associated the human skull with the thigh bone and, and had a modern man in place of an ape-like ancestor. Now, I'll tell you something very interesting about that word created. Where it is used in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 1, the Hebrew word from which it is translated is the Hebrew word bara. Now, there's another place where that word is used, and that is in Isaiah chapter 65 and in verse 17, where God says, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And so that same word 
It's an act of creation. Now, this is not just manufacturing something out of something else. It's not a case of making. It's a case of creating. It's a divine act. And so, at the end of time, God is going to recreate this world. Marvelous, more beautiful, more wonderful than ever it was in the beginning. And what a beautiful place to live. But I'll tell you this too. That same word, bara, is also used in Psalms 51 and in verse 10, where it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now, this act of creating in us a new heart is just as much a divine act as bringing the world into existence, and we need it. You see, we're so sinful, we make so many mistakes, and so we need to be recreated so that we don't do anything wrong anymore. And so God has promised that he will recreate us as we were in the beginning. And this is a promise that has been fulfilled through Jesus Christ, who came to this world and died for us so that our sins can be forgiven. But to do more than that, recreate us so that we will be fit to live in this beautiful world and live forever. We could do with the new earth, couldn't we? There are some wonderful things in this world, but the Bible says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has prepared for those who love him. How would you like to climb Mount Sinai, where God spoke the Ten Commandments to Moses? Sounds pretty strenuous. Well, it's too strenuous and too hot for me, but that's where David and the crew will be in our next program. Do join us then.